Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have the distinct pleasure of inviting uh, Erich Bühler on the podcast. Welcome, Eric. Tell us a little bit about your uh, river of life, please. Well, I think it's, um, it's about trying to lead organizations. And then I've been in many organizations. I've been working in, I think my first work, uh, Joe by God, was in 1992. Don't make any calculation with my age. But then I, I work in Microsoft. I work in several companies around the world. I work in New Zealand also. Uh, I was in the States and in several places in the world. But I think the, the last 20 years has been about um, influencing companies and try to understand the science behind. So you wrote a really interesting book on leading exponential, exponential change. What motivated you to write that book? Well, the first thing we need to understand is the situation. The situation of the market is not the same. In fact, if you take a look at the situation, around 2013, the market started accelerating. We, we started seeing that before when companies um, started using short work cycles. Then when you put something in the market, it means that you impact the market and then maybe your competitors see whatever you are doing and say, wow, look what this person, this company is doing and they do the same. So we suddenly started seeing um, acceleration in markets um, I would say that in, in 2012 it started and we could it just started consolidating around 2016. So many of the techniques we use are not working very well when you are exposed to exponential change or accelerated change if you prefer. And then we have to find uh, new theories, new practices and the science behind us. Uh, obviously human beings are not prepared for accelerations in, in markets, in, you know changes in, processes, in tools, in ways of working, constant changes. And, and this has been a challenge for the last years. And that was my mo main motivation. Yeah, prepare people to better react to rapid change. So uh, one thing that we're particularly interested in at The Focus is the world of oversight. Uh, when I have an initiative, I'm doing some work, and I can get so caught up in the detail of the work that I forget the big picture. So oversight is that function that helps us as a good guide, a good challenge to say, hey, 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 hold on a second. Did you notice this? Don't forget about that. So I'm really interested um, from your perspective of leading large organizational transformations. What have you seen that's really interesting in this area of oversight? Um, between, let's say, senior executives and initiatives doing work? Well, let's just start from the very beginning. And one of the things is important to understand is how the, the brain focuses on things. And this is quite an interesting thing. And then how stress can alter perception. Now, what we have seen is that th there are two types of focus. The first type of focus is what we call broad focus is that you can keep an open focus and focus on many things and take a look at what is happening. You maybe are paying attention to the person in front of you, to the project you are working with or product, but at the same time, you are paying attention to something else, right? This kind of broad focus, we see this broad focus specifically in certain profiles, but I would say, let, let's say that if you are relaxed, you have this broad focus. And in the brain, the broad focus is characterized by certain chemicals that are balanced um, between um, when, when you are stressed, generally uh, you have high levels of cortisol. When levels of cortisol increase, then you start going into um, another type of, of focus. But then when you're relaxed, you are able to sense everything around you. And this is crucial for, for leaders and for everyone to try to uh, have um, an, a broad focus because leaders can sense everything around. Now, when leaders of everyone is um, is start feeling stress, what happens is that levels of cortisol increase and the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is the thinking brain, uh, start getting kind of disabled, let's say. Now, the person, when the person is at that point, there are a couple of things that happen. The first is the vision narrows, and, and second, um, your brain can just focus on what is important for you. Now, normally when you are stressed, then you just focus on, on one thing, 
is that uh, you are not fired. You don't trust anyone because you believe that, you know, bad things um, would happen. Uh, and then the brain starts working in a different way when we are in a, in a place where we don't trust people, uh, where we have to finish a couple of things, then our brain instantly try to just focus on whatever is important for us, not for the rest. Uh, and, and obviously you start fighting for uh, people and resources. And this is one of the first thing we see when we are um, exposed to constant changes. And, and, and that requires a, a completely different approach. When, when we, um, if you take a look at agility 2001 or what we called classic agility, classic agility does not have any conception in terms of accelerated markets. Now, in order to evaluate accelerated market, you also need to understand the science behind what happens when people are exposed to this science and why those managers are or are not able to focus, why they focus on one thing or why they prioritize things when they should be doing the opposite. Though one of the things that's very important here is that obviously brains are not prepared for that, but there are certain tricks Right, and everything reduces to uh, certain chemicals in the brain. Now, the uh, organizations where uh, are exposed to exponential change uh, and they are not prepared, people tend to focus just on what matters for that person, uh, and also uh, the number of perspective that the person can um, sense from the from around is reduced. And and this is what we generally see now. The more we are exposed to exponential change the more we are incapable of sensing the market, sensing people, and sensing yourself. <clears throat> what is it that the uh, oversight uh, function or any oversight capability an organization can do in order to help the organization to, 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 to maintain the right type of focus to reduce that stress? Well, the first thing is we have to redefine the name. So when we started working on enterprise agility, um, what I said is, let, let's forget about the theory we have now this, and, and everything we have. So in order to go in a different direction, you need to break what, what we have now. So if you take a look, at, and I, it's going to be a long explanation, but if you take a look at Agile 2001, uh, you will see that at that point, in, in, they were all males from one or two countries creating, very clever guys who are creating the Agile Manifesto. Now, if you take an organization now, organizations are completely different. They have a lot of diversity, neurodiversity. Uh, they have a lot of different technologies that did not exist. So the, the, the first thing we have to understand is that companies are different than 20 years ago. You cannot use, there are certain ideas that you can use it, then there are others you cannot. For example, um, something we have been praying and saying all the time is you have to do retrospectives. But the um, retrospective work very well in linear markets. For example, imagine the markets are changing once a week. Human beings can uh, do retrospective. But then what happens if the market changes every two days or one day? Human beings are not prepared for that. And this is a great practice where you see it's to stop working. Right and now, the first challenge you have is try to explain that maybe what the, the markets are explaining to do they, they should do, and companies try to copycat whatever they see in other organization. They have to stop doing this, and then this is where we started trying to come up with other ideas because you know I always say if you're going to criticize something at least you have to provide an option, right? Mm -hmm. And then in order to do that, the the first thing is is that at the moment. Um, organizations are generally based on teams, or if you use some certain framework such as SAFE or others, they are based on what they call value streams or value networks. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that teams and value streams do not work very well when companies are exposed to exponential change. So now, in order to um, you be able to cope with all these, uh, you, you need for people to be able to move in the company from what they see things are changing. Maybe you need the skills in one side of the company today, you go there and the following day you need to go somewhere else. So people have to be in constant movement. Now, it, this mobilization of people and, and resources and skills, etc., have one problem and is that human beings need to be uh, for longer periods of time in one place in order to have psych what we call psychological ownership. You fall in love with what you are doing, right? And then when you don't have that, then, then it doesn't work. So we need to develop something which is called collective capabilities. And collective capabilities is basically a new way to structure organizations. And also the collective capabilities evaluate what we call neurofunctions, so uh, neuro capabilities of how well I can adapt 
to the changing markets. If I cannot adapt very well, imagine I'm hyperactive. I'm, and I'm hyperactive. I'm telling you this, not like it's a hypothetical situation. I'm hyperactive. So if you put me close to the changing market, I get crazy because it's very difficult for me. So then uh, there are certain people who also learn slower, certain people who learn quicker, certain people who learn slower, but they can go very deep. Um, there are also people who naturally lead, certain people who have more mental flexibility, and, and there are neuro capabilities. Now, new organizations need to consider that in order to, to create these collective capabilities, they need to start using uh, what we call neuro exponential profiles, which are basically um, profiles that identify people, and apart from your skills, apart from you know how well you are doing, are doing something, you need to make sure that um, you have you do this profile. It's a self assessment, and then you understand it. And this is the first thing companies need to start understanding that when everything is changing, just by evaluating capabilities, like all company, they have this. Uh, matrices where they have, you know, this is a skill, John have this skill, I move John from this team to the other team, does not work very well, because it's not going to allow John to prepare for the change, it's going to have lower levels of psychological ownership, so I, I as soon as I feel proud of I'm doing some job, I'm, they are moving me to another one, and that's going to produce again, that's going to um, erode trust, because I don't trust the company that I'm going to be in this position next month, because they are changing me all the time, so this is where um, we start seeing many uh, these functions in the organization so but to answer your question the first thing you need is to use different structures uh, and then in order to use different structures we need to have something in mind which is that organ a successful organization have um, mentally flexible people and one of the question is uh, how we make sure that when everything is changing and levels of cortisol increase. When levels of cortisol increase, your, the number of perspective you can evaluate decrease. So how you are making sure that uh, people still can see a situation. And if you think of in your life, imagine you you just go outside the cinema, you are walking on, on some alleyway, and then maybe it's 10, 10 night, and you hear some noise at the back, someone touching your shoulder, and then you're going to be very... Um, afraid so, of the situation maybe it's a friend right but your brain is going to think the worst and then um you know brains are are, are um connected in a way uh the network it's always it's very easy for the for the the brain always try to go in the negative way to protect mm. yourself yeah yeah so a follow-up question on that um you talked about understanding people's neuro capabilities um, and there's probably quite a lot of techniques uh, or uh, models that, that that can describe that. But what what is what what is it that organizations can do to prevent um, other people in the organization from weaponizing the information from those neuro capabilities and use it against people in the organization? So the first thing we need to uh, understand is something called infobesity, which is a, the, a high number of information coming in the company. So if you take a look at the organization, um, people who are uh, closer to the market need to uh, or get more information than people inside the company, right? This is some a concept we call neuro exponential band. But basically what it says is that if you're in the middle of the company, uh, you're a little bit more protected than if you are outside or, or in the, in the edges of, of the company. So the first thing we need to do is, and this is where technology can help very well, is to try to make sure that people just receive what is important for them. Now, and, and in here we can also use some artificial intelligence instead of uh, getting 200 emails, maybe you get in bunches every one hour, the emails, but information comes in a way which is not disruptive, but also, uh, we need to understand about um, the capacity of this person to process information. Because obviously, you have a, everyone has a maximum number of things they can do and they, they can absorb every day. And then maybe if you are working and then you get an email and then your boss comes and tells you something and then you know so many things happen, uh, that's going to uh, kind of overload your cognitive 
a cognitive area of the cognitive area of your brain. So the first thing we need to see in companies is the possibility for organizations to understand that the the number of information from the market and the number of disruption is not going to decrease, it's going to increase. So how we can, I'm, I'm not going to say protect people, but then how we can have technology. In fact, there are many interesting technologies with artificial intelligence, with filter, they put whatever you need in different folders, depending on trying to analyze the language inside, etc. The second thing we need is obviously to use big data, because big data can do a, a great work in terms of um, um, summing up information. So the higher the changes in the market are, the more you have to seriously use technologies. Now, there are other things that happen with people exposed to exponential change, which is a decrease in, in oxygen in the brain. And this is something we've seen leaders because uh, obviously you need to, you are more stressed. When you're more stressed, the um, uh, levels of uh, oxygen in the brain are higher, mm -hmm. levels of cortisol are higher, it, when the and, and this is something interesting. And we, we have been working with leaders and trying to measure their oxygen levels. And you can see effectively that they have less oxygen. So uh, there are so many things. Uh, for example, one of the interesting things is that sometimes leaders do not know they are stressed. And a yes. consultant had to go there and, 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 and give a, an external perspective. Once you are stressed and, you, and there are more than one person, you do not realize. So I think in this sense, companies need to start investing in making sure the information employees receive is in a way that they are prepared for that. And then maybe later we talk about certain techniques. Yeah, one thing that I find really fascinating around stress is we don't have enough words, enough um, clarity to identify the different kinds of stress. Because stress, I find, is is on a broad range, a broad spectrum. From I don't have any stress at all, I'm under stress, if you will, in an area of just nothing happens. I get easily bored, easily distracted. Um, I get restless. I get um, a kind of upset. Hey, hey, I don't have anything to do. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum is, oh my God, everything is is so chaotic. There's so much pressure, so much threat, so much dynamism in the world around me. Ah, I can't cope with, with this stress. And this reminds me also, Kelly McGonigal had a really interesting TED talk about how to make stress your, your friend, where she points out that it's really fascinating that what's really surprisingly important is your attitude to stress. If you look at stress as, oh, this stress is making me stronger. This is giving me an opportunity to get better. Then all of a sudden your body seems to mobilize and, and make that happen. So I found that really um, astonishing. What's your view on this balance of stress? Well, there are a couple of interesting things you said is how to categorize stress and in order to categorize stress you need to do something very important which is acknowledge a point there is a turning point in your brain when you cannot go back so the imagine that you start feeling stress and then after a certain point it's a roller coaster and you cannot it's very hard for you to come back uh, to a position where uh, you can um, evaluate situations and evaluate things right now, obviously, as you said, categorizing is good. And how we know that? Well, there are a lot of science at the moment. Uh, one of the things that happen when you are really stressed, because what we try to do is try to identify, and specifically when we work with leaders and um, that you know they are leading other people and you don't want these leaders to start having the wrong uh, behavior for that company, maybe the right behavior for another company. But then it, something we generally see are some changes that you can uh, see in your body. And those changes are detectable. You can detect them. And then as soon as you see those changes, then, then you can say, OK, I'm stressed. But you, you, you detect it in an indirect way. You detect it because those changes happen, not because you feel the stress. OK, I'm stressed, and I have to do something now. 
And there are a couple of techniques which helps um, reducing um, stress. Now, one of the interesting things is the more stressed you are, the, the higher the levels of cortisol are in your brain. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, companies where they, they feel as, as we were mentioning um, behind the scenes about, you know, some different terms, but it's organizational health at the end, how people feel safe, uh, is that a company where they have chronic uh, problems or a bad situation, then people have chronic uh, levels, high levels of, of cortisol. Now, what we have seen is that a direct relationship between innovation and business value delivered to customers. Now, we started looking into that, and what we saw is uh, the, the very interesting thing and very interesting pieces of research, that the higher the levels of cortisol, the less perspectives you can see. So when you're relaxed and then you're having a conversation, imagine that Aldo or Euphoria, you, you, you are having a, a discussion with me, but a relaxed discussion. I might be able to evaluate your perspectives, uh, evaluate your facts, even try to have some empathy, how you feel, try to think of your values and feel your values as mine. But then as soon as levels of cortisol start increasing, then the number of perspectives uh, decrease. And this is one of the frameworks we have been working um, a few years ago and have been very successful called the four levels of awareness of mental agility, which basically allows you to see how many things from outside you can evaluate. And the important thing is based on of how many things of this you can evaluate and how stressed you are. So you evaluate the stress in an indirect way. And then it, 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 we, we give you some techniques for you to make sure that you reduce stress. Now, it, a person who is, uh, has high levels of uh, cortisol in the brain, cortisol is not bad, otherwise you would not get off bed in the morning. But then uh, high levels of cortisol, um, people see less perspectives. Now, that's the connection between levels of cortisol and innovation and business value. Whoever thought that company with uh, bad organizational health can innovate, I challenge that. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I find interesting what brings to mind for me um, is, um, for instance, first responders and people in uh, high risk uh, jobs, they learn specific breath work exercises. So interesting that you take a step back, you do something like box breathing or, or something like that, and that immediately kind of gets you better oxygenated, gets you better ability to notice context. It literally opens up. It's like a leadership superpower, if you will. This take a step back, take a breath, relax, notice, pay attention to what's happening and uh, make a call that way, right? So that's a really intimately tied into what you were describing as the pace or intensity of activity increases, we get this stress, cortisol increases, then if you deliberately notice, if you interrupt that and you engage in breath work, that can help sort of lower, uh, kind of counterbalance um, the uh, cortisol excess and then open up, as you were saying, the, the way of reasoning. Now, another really interesting nugget that you brought out was this relationship between stress and empathy. Because we could argue that in, in modern life, we can see an excess of polarization where we've forgotten how to empathize with other fellow humans. We are very quick to anger, very quick to outrage, very quick to demonize other communities and say, oh, they are evil in some way. Isn't this yet another expression of this challenge of overstress and um, struggle to cope with too rapid a change pace? What do you think? Well, there are a couple of things to have in mind in here. The first thing is that in, I think it was in 2001, no, 2000, I think it was, they gave me an award for best article for the Agile Spectrum, which was how to deal with psychopath uh, during Agile change. Um, and one of the interesting things is that certain companies have higher number of psychopathic people. Now, psychopathic people are not people who are going to just stab you physically, right? But they do it in a different way. So if you take a look at the uh, companies, most of companies I've been helping in the last few years have been banks and, you know, financial area, etc. Now, 
those companies are generally where you have the highest number of psychopathic people or you know the certain levels of uh, we are not professionally um able to identify them but then i'm professionally you can do this i always say when i talk to the neuroscientists and we work together i say well i'm not a neuroscientist but i use my brain all the time so i'm allowed to make an opinion right and one of the things that is important here is certain organizations have higher levels of psychopath this is an important thing to consider now the second thing is that many people work on those companies. And the third thing is that there is a relationship between empathy and, and accelerated markets. Now, something also very important is there is um, neurofrin, a specific uh, chemical in the brain that when you're stressed, uh, it decreases. Now, this specific, um, specific chemical allows you to focus. Now, obviously, uh, when you do, you are stressed, you cannot focus, you cannot even focus on the other person. And then obviously you start protecting yourself. Mm. Um, this is where we need to understand several things is that uh, specifically with leaders, um, leaders need to be very clear about which values we have. But there is some, an very, very important change in leadership of, uh, let's say, the 21st century, right? And which is that for many years, we have been using certain leadership and other types of leadership and they work well, but there are certain restrictions in these types of leadership. And I will tell you why. And that's what also brings uh, bad behaviors in, or not desired behaviors in companies. Now, when you're exposed to exponential changes, what, imagine, let me give you an, an easy example. If you're a, a, just in a company where everything is plus minus the same, you have some market disruptions, et cetera. Uh, so in there, you, you generally don't break promises. So if you promise someone that they are going to get some rise in the salary or whatever, a new position, uh, you just deliver it. If you break that promise, then you break trust. You destroy trust. And, and then when you destroy trust, as other chemicals also uh, you know, decrease in the brain, oxytocin and others, and it's very difficult to rebuild trust. Now, what happened here is when we are exposed to exponential changes, the type of leadership is different. And this is where we do a lot of research and, and try to come up with something which is called M, M, M leadership framework, which is for M from mobilizing. When people are exposed to um, changing market, people generally freeze. They don't move, they don't know what to do. And, and then when you don't know what to do, we just focus on you and the process around to help you succeed. And obviously that decreases the, the uh, levels of empathy uh, for others, right? Um, now, we are exposed to uh, exponential changes. The type of leadership is different because you have to break, the lead, leader have to break promises and increase trust at the same time. This is the kind of leadership we need to see in the next couple of years. And in order to do that, you need a completely different approach for leadership. So, with with making promises, you you create hope in in the in the people that you're making those promises to, um, and when you break it, and you break that repeatedly, not only break trust but that false hope that it generates in people, um, leads to uh, yeah, people not really believing what you're saying anymore so you talk about the different type of leader for in the future to deal with exponential change how would that leader look like and not and and what what can you do not to create uh false hope well for many years we have seen expectations as something that have to be delivered but then if you already know that maybe things are going to change then it's going to be different. How do we do that? Well, the first thing is that levels of um, mental agility, what we call mental agility, has to be higher in your employees because there is a direct relationship on how well you manage your emotion when something changed and mental agility. So if you are more flexible, then you are exposed to a situation which is something unexpected. You're going to take it more positively and you're going to work in a way to make sure that uh, you, you solve that situation, right? Mm. So then uh, when we started doing this, we realized that it was very difficult to measure mental agility and, until we came up with a way of measuring mental agility. 
Now, organizations need to be able to measure, not because of the sake of saying we are the most clever company, but at least every employee needs to be able to measure your levels of mental agility. Now, why? Because uh, higher levels of mental agility or people with higher levels of mental agility, when there is a surprise in the market or something changes, uh, they can handle emotions better. Now they have lower levels of cortisol and they can able to, they are able to do something which is crucial, which is called reframing. Reframing is a possibility, not just uh, from seeing this problem from different perspective, but embracing the values from someone who is, you feel is against you. Um, and this is very important. So when we are talking about organizations, organization, that's why the neuro part, uh, it's, it, it's crucial. So if you want an organization where leaders can break promises and people say, you know, I understand very well and, you know, what is happening here. I feel pity for the leader that promised something and he knows that and I talk to him. And if you want this kind of thing that it's going to keep over time, uh, this sustainability of um, behaviors, because one of the things that you see when there's a market disruption is not a change in mindset, it's a change in behaviors. And this is something you can measure. And, and there is a great model we developed, which is called the voice model, the voice model. And the mo voice models allow you to evaluate uh, how many changes have been in behavior. Now, if you want for uh, people to feel comfortable with breaking promises, you need to make sure that people have high levels of mental agility. So there's, there's quite a lot of things happening uh, over the recent uh, number, last six months around mental health in the workplace what's the link between workplace mental health and mental agility well i wanted first to step back to what happened during the pandemic as that's give us a clue of, of uh, what happened there and one of the things uh, when i published my book i think was 2017 18 i cannot remember is uh, i developed a theory which is called enterprise social system which basically what it does it try to um, it says that in order for you uh, to be in a virtual environment you need to recreate certain things that are in the physical environment and we don't have enough technology yet but then uh, what we have seen during the pandemic and this is the important part is uh during the pandemic teams tended to have uh, or increase the links with those people they, they trusted before the pandemic and push away all the people that they have less trust. And that is crucial because even if you don't trust those people, you trust less, uh, then maybe you need those people to create the practice part of the value stream. So imagine that you have two or three people who, uh, those two or three people, you have high trust. You see all these people all the time. Um, and then what happened there is that, uh, sorry, I think, oh my God, something bite me. <laughs> <laughs> that just happens on, on, uh, on live. Even I was talking to you, well, so what happened here is my brain stopped and said, well, there is something very, very important. And you see it's all red here. And, and then it started probably um, it's just increasing levels of, of cortisol to stop me doing this. And, 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 and then if I had someone in front of me, I would say, please help me, what's happening here? Now, the important thing here is um, when you're in a situation where um, these uh, levels of uh, trust are fluctuating all the time, uh, people generally uh, focus more on, on the people they trust and they completely disconnect from the people they don't trust that much. All right, and, and that create, create this functionality because if you take a look at the models we have now, they, they are based mainly on themes or value streams. So it means that value streams start getting more um, uh, dysfunctional. And then if part of this company is working, like for example, uh, remote two days a week and three days a week they are in house, then these uh, people start getting further away from the people they don't trust much and closer to the other people and create a lot of different dysfunctionalities. So the first thing we need to do in order to um, change the organization and make sure that the, the organization uh, worked well is you need to start thinking of how those people with less trust can still connect uh, before even doing any other thing because it also alters how information flows in the system. I want to go back to the link between mental agility and mental health in the workplace. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, okay, so the, there, there are a couple of things you need to understand is that your, your brain is very malleable, but then we were talking to uh, Andre Vermeulen, one of the neuroscientists, and he says that when you start feeling that your brain is not working fine or well, um, then it can you need to go up to eight years backwards because your brain are very resilient. So maybe the problem is not from last year, the problem is not from two years ago, maybe the problem is from five years ago. And, and, and this degrad, you know, when the, your um, mental health start degrading, um, you don't notice it, it for maybe one or two years, you notice it um, a few years after. But there are certain things that you know and you can notice, and I will tell you that there are things very, very important to take a look. So for example, how you know if your mental health is not going well? Well, that sometimes you know because you feel depressed, you feel worried, but other times you don't know. So for example, if you notice that during the, the uh, night time, you go several times to the toilet, uh, usually uh, it means that you have a very um, light sleep and certain areas of your brain uh, do not engage into this sleep. Uh, and then uh, whatever happened in your brain, even it should be less important, uh, is taking over. So mm. if you notice that uh, you go during that time, you go several times uh, to the toilet, it, it means that your levels of stress are high. Also, um, maybe your brain might be deteriorating at this time. And, and also uh, one of the things that I have seen in organizations is organization not living up to their values. So maybe uh, making people work extra hours, maybe, uh, and this is something we see in, in an exponential world. It's not one-off, like, oh, this, let's come this weekend, I bring some pizzas, um, it's one-off, it's not gonna happen again. It, it is gonna happen again. Um, and, and this is a very, very important. So um, now also multitasking. And, and then I have the experience with one company in New Zealand. I wanted to mention, I also mentioned that in 2017, where uh, people were doing, all were doing multitasking, all mm -hmm. were doing multitasking. And then this company wanted to, they needed some uh, to get a million dollars every month uh, cash for doing some changes in the organization. And they did not, um, they did not have this million dollars. So they wanted to start firing people to get the money. And imagine if you fire people, then the rest of the people in the company is gonna be afraid. And then yeah. maybe you fire some people and, 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 and those people are gonna be afraid and then mental health is gonna deteriorate, mm -hmm. right? And I think it was enough during pandemic for many people, it was very strong situation, hard situation for that. Um, then in that company, just by reducing multitasking, we were able to save the company this million dollars. So uh, when you have, uh, when you need mental health, you need healthy habits and micro habits. So one of the questions that, that, that as consultant we have to check is how many of the habits and micro habits this company has are healthy, as simple as that. Yeah. Um, what this brings to mind for me is the work of Susan David. She speaks a lot about emotional agility. So I have a suspicion that uh, when you were mentioning uh, mental agility, you were probably incorporated or incorporating or combining the logical, rational aspects with the more emotional aspects. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, and then you need to acknowledge your feelings. The, the, mm. I, I remember that when I, when I was uh, helping some client in China, uh, specifically in Hong Kong, one of the things they said is do not bring your emotions into the table here for the, to the meetings. Mm. And then you're a human being, you cannot be without emotions in a meeting and then having emotions after. And then I have seen in Colombia um, an advertising from an IT company. They're saying we are looking for someone who is uh, stress proof. So, they, they, you know, if you are a human being, if you want innovation and you want healthy people, uh, you need to acknowledge that people have emotions. Mm. And the only thing you can do is to make sure they have healthier habits. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a really fascinating um, challenge of leadership, isn't it? 
uh, noticing stress, pay, uh, stress, paying attention to stress, and then relieving stress, nurturing the organization in such a way that uh, stress can actually be, be dealt with effectively. Another uh, thing that uh, comes to mind for me is you were talking about the, the useful adversary and developing empathy with your opponent. And that sounds very much like Sun Tzu and his art of war that suggests that uh, when you know both yourself and your opponent really well, then you can be assured of uh, victory um, quite easily. But if you're not aware of either yourself or your opponent, you can't rely on prevailing. Yeah. So how do we learn more about each other? How do we develop better awareness of both ourselves and our useful adversaries? Well, Sun Tzu said, the enemy is where you are not. So, you know, you, you, we always try to find the enemy where the enemy is not. And one of the things we have seen is the impact of what we call intellectual humility. Now, people can be humble, but intellectual humility is something you practice and, and humility is something you were born. The idea behind intellectual humility is that you don't mind, you don't care, and you celebrate if you are wrong. Now, what we have seen is um, last year we developed the first framework in the world to increase intellectual humility in leaders. Now, we also saw that the brain of a person with high levels of intellectual humility works in a different way. Now, a couple of things are different apart from the activation of the brain is different. Um, what we have seen is that a leader or a person with higher levels of like, intellectual humility, apart from they don't mind if they are wrong, they say, well, you're wrong. Well, let's celebrate, I'm wrong, I learned something new. Um, they, we, what the research says is that people with higher levels of intellectual humility, they uh, in, take on board more information, even if they contradict their beliefs or their initial ideas, mm -hmm. and also they get on board more people. So instead of you just working with the two people you know, to get on board uh, uh, with uh, them. Now, one of the keys for companies uh, to adapt to new situation is for leaders to have higher levels of intellectual humility. And this is where the lighthouse model, the lighthouse model is this first model in the world to increase intellectual humility can help. Because without intellectual humility, you cannot lead during times of exponential change or accelerated change where things are going to change and you're going to be wrong all the time. Yeah. So, wow, that's that's quite very interesting about accepting that you will be wrong no matter what you do. That That's quite humbling. Now, <laughs> I find that we have a really a tough challenge with language. Notice how we're phrasing this. I am wrong, right? Now, that essentially proposes a foundational challenge to my being because if i am wrong then there's something wrong with me and also it's very tempting if i happen to embrace more of a fixed mindset whoa it mm. invalidates me as a person because i don't necessarily believe that i can change if i am wrong there's something wrong with me and oh my god i'm doomed there's no hope uh, whereas yeah and remember the levels of cortisol increase when you are wrong <laughs> and then uh, the neurofrine and other uh, um, chemicals that help you focus decrease and then you end up in a situation where we go back to the previous question that you asked me like half an hour ago um, about empathy and then empathy decreases yeah yeah but what if we had different language and rather than i am wrong we would more easily refer to, oh, this idea is not right. This idea is wrong. This well, self-identification with ideas and perspectives yeah. is so powerful, isn't it? Well, at the end of the day, um, language, and this is something I mentioned in my book, uh, uh, Laura, I cannot remember her last name. She's going to kill me. Um, she did a massive research on, on how language uh, impacts on the, on the brain. And one of the things we need to understand is that the language for different people mean different things and good consultants adapt their language to the company. So for example, I always say, I don't like wearing a suit, but if, if I'm going to a company where everyone is wearing a suit and everyone is talking about uh, using certain words, I'm gonna use those words because it's the way that I impact their the, 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 the brains. So a good consultant is someone who influences another person. 
uh, or, a, or a company. It's not someone who brings a, a new framework and, and, and try to teach how to uh, how to do it. Even it's challenging, but I believe it's more challenging to influence people. So uh, it's interesting because uh, some aborigines in, in Australia, this is something I mentioned in my book, um, they, they know where the north and west is, even they put it in a place where they don't know where it is. So your brain is very malleable and, and, and language um, uh, change behaviors. And if you take a look at my book, the, the, there, there is one model which basically is called ELSA model. And the ELSA model allows you to change behaviors based on language. Now, when I was uh, developing that framework, I realized that there were some research and then obviously, as you say, I'm wrong. Um, and, but it doesn't happen in other languages. In other languages, you say wrong first and then you say I, so it dilutes the emotional part, but in English is the way it works, right? And, and then I understand your ideas. Uh, and also I think that if you are okay with being wrong yourself, is more powerful too, right? If you say I'm wrong and I am wrong and you repeat it a hundred times and you are happy and you celebrate you are wrong and this is not bad. Now, the important thing is, is, is the, the brain is an animal of habits. So the more you practice it, the more you comfortable feel with this, right? But language influences the way that mm. we influence change. And it complicates it because my first language is not English. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so by saying I'm wrong, I mean that the idea I have had uh, was not right. So, um, yeah. By the sound of our accents, English is not our, our main <laughs> language for either of us <laughs> on this call. Yeah. Well, I think that um, also there are different things with different languages. And there are interesting things with some languages of, of how the structures uh, influence change. So one of the things we have seen also is that um, there are certain languages where there is no direct way to, to, to write in a future tense. For example, in, in English, we say, I will go, or I, 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 you, know, you can use future tenses um, and ways of structuring it. Now, the language where there is no future, well, where they have seen, is something interesting is that uh, people see the future in a different way. And in fact, there is a, a research which shows that uh, where, where languages where there is no a future tense, people tend to save more money because they see the future as an extension of the present. So there is um, a, a connection between language and, and how we use language and then also how we see things. Now also changing certain words in organizations, there are certain words that you can detect use, that the organization use, and I cannot harmful, um, are not very, or at least uh, it provoke a sense of urgency, but in an unhealthy way. And if you change just those words, you, you kind of increase organizational health. Talking, of, talking of organizational health, um, Earlier on in, in the recording, you spoke about this high degree of psychopaths, the, the psychopathic behaviors or psychopaths um, inside certain uh, types of organizations. With this awareness, what are you noticing is happening in industry uh, around dealing with this psychopathy? Well, nothing is happening, <laughs> really. I think... Um... Um, it, it, it's a long way um, to deal with this. Now, imagine that we have developed the neuro exponential profile to try to um, understand the capabilities of or neuro capabilities of people. And it's going to take a long way until coaches and consultants understand and companies understand it because I think the foundations of the companies are not ready to understand um, that there are certain types of personality, manipulative personalities that they, they, they do not, even if they look like they are high performers, they are not. Because mm -hmm. what they produce 10 times more, but then, then they produce 10 times more, but then the team do not but then they get all the, the rewards. And then obviously we need to change the reward systems uh, mm. in order to, to make sure it works. Uh, mm. And sometimes when the company gets a little bit chaotic because of exponential change, 
they have to be very serious. But I think it, we are a long way from uh, achieving at least a minimum success on trying to integrate psychopaths into the company and at the same time protecting people around them if those psychopaths are nasty people. But you know, in that case, I think we are a long way yet. I think we also have an interesting challenge of classification and language here because we're talking about psychopaths as opposed to people with psychopathic behaviors because uh, psychopathic traits that's right people can change and uh, if we if we sort of lump them in and say hey look um my behaviors my habits have given me a benefit uh, they have brought me to this position of affluence uh, look at uh, my position i am well regarded in the organization otherwise i wouldn't be the senior vice president of such and such what do you mean i have to change why should i change because i have the um power the adulation the remuneration why should i change what, what what's in it for me what's the benefit yeah so um we have a really interesting challenge of yeah, you get all of this benefit, but do you notice that this is on the back of so much suffering for so many other people? How is that okay? Yeah. Well, but so there is a change in psychopaths. They have a, there is a specific area of the brain which is related to empathy. Uh, that the size of that uh, part is, is uh, looks to be smaller, um, and and then that's one of the challenges that uh, when you analyze the brain of those people, that it works in a different way. Um, I'm not saying all of them are bad because some of them are good at executing things. They don't make any harm to anyone. But I'm talking about people with um, these psychopathic traits. And I, I remember, I will tell you a story in 2000. And I think this story ended up with me 10 years after writing this article on how to deal with psychopaths during actual change. Um, I was in 2006. I was a scrum coach in London. Um, what happened there was that we had a psychopathic person and that person was a very high in the ladder. We was a manager, very high manager under the CEO of the company. Now, this guy was all the time shouting to people and using, you know, despective words and all the things. And then one day I arrived to the company and I was a scrum coach. Everyone in that team, one guy was crying, a lady was feeling bad, another guy was the same. And they talked to me and said, Eric, we need to organize a meeting and tell this guy what we think about the situation. We cannot allow this guy to do it again. He came here, he started punching the table and he said, oh, you finish with this product and you have high quality in the product and you come the weekend, I don't care about you or you are all fired. Um, and then we need to tell this guy how we feel. So what I did is organize this meeting and I brought, it was like eight people into this meeting. I did a kind of retrospective. Uh, as soon as I brought this person, I asked, okay, guys, how are you doing? I did that like ice breaking. I said, how is the, the sprint going? And everyone said, the sprint is really good. And I asked, well, nothing happened in these two weeks. And they said, no, no, everything is fine. In fact, um, everything is great, never experienced anything. And, and then uh, what happened there is that I said, okay, imagine that I have a problem with this person and it was a person close to me, it was the psychopath. Um, what would you do? Well, finally, it, we, nobody wanted to mention anything and they fired me like three days after, right? And that was on one of the companies, they fired me. And, and then I put several years, I was trying to understand. Obviously, we never put a crazy person into a retrospective or any meeting. <laughs> rule number one. Rule number two, if people don't feel safe, don't think you're going to get anything positive from that. Don't think even you are going to get anything. That's the two rules I learned. Yeah. And, 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 and red, rule number three is if you want to do it, be ready for the company to fire you because those people are very manipulative and they're going to get rid of you as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I was very amused uh, chatting with a few uh, fellow Agile practitioners at Agile 2022 earlier this year. And it occurred to us that uh, the most experienced of us have been fired at least once in our career, if not, if not more. <laughs> but sometimes you are fired 
<laughs> but then again, you protect your mental health, which is um, what we were discussing. And I, I remember in one case, I also resigned uh, when I was in 2000 and I think it was 2005, four, I was uh, working for, a, I would say the name, the London Stock Exchange. And we used to work Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and Sunday we worked from nine to five, uh, Saturday we worked nine to eight, and then generally during the week was nine to 11 or something like that. And then after six months, I could not go with this. You know, my hands were shaking and I said, this is too much for me. And at the same time, I said, I'm not gonna get the same salary. You know, this is the first thing that comes to your mind, your sense of security, safety around. Well, I resigned, I talked to my sister. My sister said, you cannot be, my hands were shaking. You're gonna be this way. I resigned and then I, 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 I got another job where I have like 50% more salary. It was a great team and I enjoy it. So uh, self limitations are always important to believe that things are not gonna get better. And, and that's related to what we said uh, before about when you have high levels of cortisol, um, your your work, uh, your brain is, is networked in a way that always see as something bad is gonna happen, right? And this is something we need to learn too, how to deal with this. Change of tack here. Um... Earlier on in the recording, you talked about uh, the older techniques, uh, especially with the with the start of the agile movement, uh, are not suitable for accelerated change. Um, what are some of the techniques that you notice uh, does allow you to keep up with this accelerated pace? From agile, you mentioned. Yeah. Okay, so there are many. There are many. I would say like around. 70% are there. The only problem is if you try to use the other 30%, when you try to use the other 30%, it's going to downgrade the 70% the, the of the, the other things. But let's say that, for example, um, making sure you have a, a something as simple as having a backlog where you have a unique priority, and then you just focus on that. This is very important because if the market are changing, everything is active, but you can focus on one thing, yeah. and you know that you're going to be able to do that and to achieve this uh that is important the second thing that they they added i think last year is that they, for example with the scrum this is not from agile but it's from scrum that you have an objective now for the sprint this is good because it keep you focused it keeps the in certain levels of um um chemicals that are going to motivate you to do that um also there are a uh, face-to-face communication well, mm. we know that when you have um um, a communication face to face, and especially if you look at the eyes of the other person, levels of oxytocin increase, and that you want to make you feel happy. And oxytocin is also related to trust. So the higher the oxytocin is, the more you trust the other person. In fact, there there, there were an experiment a few years ago where they put couples in um in a kind of dating uh, program, and they ask everyone to look at it at the eyes of the other person for a couple of minutes while they were talking and then most of them like the other person. And, and, and this is because uh, it, it create trust, the fact that you look at the eye, not, not everyone can feel comfortable, but then one of the, the beauty of agility is the, the fact that you go and talk to someone, it's a face-to-face uh, communication. Now, it's also important to understand that uh, our brains love repetitive things. Uh, and, and this inertia of having the sprint and knowing that, uh, you know, on Monday I start something, on Friday I finish or whatever it is, is good. And there are some tricks that can be done and you will see how interesting in a, in a there is something called priming. So in a company, what we did is we put some um, light pointing to a wall. And then when the sprint started, uh, those lights, that wall was green then yellow in the middle of the sprint and, and green at the very end. Now, what happened is your brain, um, and uh, this is part of something called enterprise social visibility, which is in my, in my book also. Um, your brain start associating certain things and actions with the, this color. So uh, you know that red is that maybe you need to put the product in, in the market. Uh, maybe yellow is that you need to do the testing, etc. Now, what happened if you change the color uh, or you change the color before, people are gonna uh, instantly start doing this. And uh, this is an interesting thing of how you can prime 
behaviors without people knowing. Um, and something very important you also need to understand is your brain consumes a lot of oxygen. So when you're exposed to exponential change, what you want is for people to have less consumption of oxygen as possible in the company, because in that way, you bring it to, um, up to a, a, a optimal level. But there are many things that I think are interesting from Agile, and they work very well. And it also helps as long as you agree that, or, or at least see that the other things do not cope um, very well. And all the things that, it, it, I would say something, it does not work well and something I, it works well. So the, this person who come with the idea of flattening the whole company, that, that's not gonna work because you know certain people like power and they, mm -hmm. they like prestige. And then if you come with the idea of, the, you know, they're gonna lose, feel they lose prestige and power, they, they're gonna sabotage. The, the, the whole company. So this is important. So self-organizing teams is a good thing as long as we understand human dynamics. Okay. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> also earlier, you talked about um, stress uh, and so on. And one thing we notice when it comes to stress, the moment you use the G word, the governance word, people are already in a heightened state of alertness. Um, what is it that you think um, people in those situations or in those positions can do, people in governance or in oversight, what is it that I can do to just lower the tension or the stress response uh, from other people when, when they engage with, with, with those people? Well, there are two things here. One of the things I recommend in the book is when you deal, when you see a situation which is uh, increasing the tension during this conversation, you need to stop, do something else, and then come back. Okay, and put certain rules, but you need to stop. You cannot continue because otherwise uh, it, get, it gets worse and worse. The other thing we need to understand is uh, about how to deal when uh, we have high levels of stress, right? And then the as Horia said, there are breathing techniques. The uh, Wim Hof technique is good. There is um, another technique for breathing, which is great, which is, uh, um, so when you're stressed, basically levels of generally of um, oxygen decrease because your brain can consume up to 30% of the whole oxygen in your body, just your brain, right? So then when you're stressed, what happens is you start consuming more and more and more oxygen. And obviously, um, you know, it's, 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 you can um, get certain oxygen, but you cannot get more. Well, there are techniques to get more. Um, and, and there are certain techniques to quickly um, increase levels of oxygen when you feel stress. We may work very well at the point I feel a little bit of stress, I do it. Um, and there is a specific technique for, um, a specific technique for breathing so imagine you are swimming in your pool and suddenly something happened and you start sinking, all right? And you cannot breathe for a few seconds. You are drawing there, uh, drawing there, and then you feel like um, you cannot get any oxygen. As soon as you go up, uh, there, is, there is a specific reaction for your body to get a, a massive amount of oxygen in a matter of one second. And what happened when you do this technique is like, you have to do it in two parts first, yeah, because the first one opens the trachea mm -hmm. here, and the second one gets the, the oxygen. You need to do it in two, two, two times, like, and then it's very important that you breathe out very slowly. That technique works very well. Now, what you see, if you pay attention, if you're stressed, is that your sight start broadening. So when you're stressed, you can focus on one thing, and then broadens your sight, and that means that your levels of cortisol decreased and it's very interesting. So I would say first, you cannot lead people if you are super stressed. And second, um, it, it, you need to make sure that in order to lead others, you lead yourself first. Mm. One interesting resource here is the Huberman Lab uh, podcast. Uh, yes, he's very good. Yes, Andrew Huberman is very good. He, he did a great research about that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's really fascinating in terms of many aspects. Because one thing that we didn't talk about that's really helpful with 
maintaining a really good capability is the general level of fitness that you maintain. So if you engage in even walk through nature, walk through a park, work through the woods, if you can, right? Uh, the Japanese have this term of um, forest bathing, shinin in yoka. Um, we learn so... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's no mystery that getting a good degree of exercise is really, really healthy. <laughs> right? And especially, especially if you feel the stress. Now, the problem is when you feel stress, you don't want to exercise because you feel tired, but you need to break. And I, I was talking to a neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Andre Vermeulen, and he said, even if you feel stress, force yourself to go to the gym, to go for a walk, to do something you enjoy where you need to oxygenate your body and do it even if you are tired. It's so much better, even if you are try, tired, to drag yourself there than not to do it. And that reminds me, I love doing a sport and reminds me one of the companies I, I was working in London several years ago during the interview, they told me, well, there is just one rule in this company is that we pay for the gym and you have to, you have to go at least three times a week. Um, with me, it's not a problem because I love the sport, right? I say, okay, where I have to sign there. <laughs> yeah. And this is the kind of thing that pays off, right? Having people and even having classes in the company where the company pays for those lessons or classes or even go around in the, on the bicycle, putting a, a couple of bicycles. And, and one of the things that I recommended in one company is to have some treadmills and do the, um, do the meetings in a treadmill as um, something also important is, um, and Andre Vermeulen also mentioned a couple of studies where if you are sitting the whole day, you have lower levels of oxygen, but if you're standing, you have more, and there is a direct relationship between innovation and business value in companies and, and levels of oxygen in your brain. So these tables that you can take up and down are better. And if you have a meeting, it's not a bad idea. You put a couple of treadmills or bicycles and people just exercise a little bit while you know they have the meeting and it's good fun. That's right. That's right. Well, um, one thing that, that struck me is apparently some people have gone into uh, intense research to see, for instance, a couple of really good techniques um, for sort of keeping you in, in peak fitness have to do with cold exposure and heat exposure. So for instance, sauna and either a cold shower or an ice bath. And what I found really fascinating is that it appears that according to this research, about 11 minutes per week of cold exposure, which is perfectly doable, right? Um, it's like a minute and a half a day kind of thing, right? So it doesn't have to be a, a ridiculous amount and you get really fantastic benefits. And again, um, it's I think 57 minutes or so of, of heat exposure. And that, that's like two or three um, sauna um, sort of uh, 20 minute uh, sessions, which again is perfectly feasible. Uh, in in a week, so that. But again, again be... our brains start putting different priority when we're stressed, right? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but where I'm coming from is it. It looks like it's not all of that difficult to uh, to develop and sustain really good physical condition as well. Yeah, but I, and I think that um, companies sometimes need to provide people, uh, you know, be, especially big companies they have the space to do that they they have um, the opportunity to get some health professionals trainers etc and they can help with that um they, there is also a, a connection obviously um in between how well you connect with these workers or colleagues that you were training together uh, and then how well you're gonna um, uh, how resilient you're gonna be and how well connected and this social network is gonna work when you are exposed to changes, right? Because they're gonna support you. Uh, and if you want um, 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 hyper productive teams, you need to make sure that they connect, not just work, but then outside work and doing activities and other things, right? So David Mokai talks about red work and blue work. I think we need to introduce green work as well. So uh, where you actually, do go and do something together as a team or you go spend some time in nature uh, and so on just a just a thought 
Yeah, but they, they, people should not be forced to do it. I remember, uh, you know, many, I think it happened to you also when you go to companies and people from certain areas, human resources, people, talent or whatever, they just organize that for you. And then you feel like you have to go there, right? Ideally, they should provide a couple of options, different days, and then you do it if you want. Uh, and then you connect as at the end of the day, um, everything works where people put the best from them and they're gonna put the best from them if they do it because they really want to do it, not because somebody forcing them to do it, right? This kind of uh, uh, team meeting uh, where they team building, where they take people and then they do it because someone else wants to do it, but they don't see the purpose. Now, if uh, people don't see the purpose, it's not gonna work. Cool. Um, Eric, uh, what have we um, not asked you that we were supposed to ask you? Uh, well, I'm very bad with that question. I have a massive blind spot with this. <laughs> it's very, it's very hard to realize because there are so, so many things. So um, let me think in terms of. Oh yeah. So uh, there is something very important. I think we need to understand when we started the, with this exponential change. We also realized that there are two types of people. I don't like categorizing people, but for people to understand at least, the people who really want to work on their mindset and the people who do not really want to work on their mindset. Okay. So when I was uh, working in New Zealand, we were talking well, many years ago, we were talking about a team of changing mindset. And, uh, and the guy came and said, listen, I'm like 61, 62, I cannot remember. And he said, I don't want to change my mindset. I'm just getting retired next year. And then I don't really want, and it's totally acceptable and fine for someone who want to change their mindset or someone who do not. So imagine someone want to use the lighthouse model to increase intellectual humility. It's great because they want to work on that, but what if not? So we started working in some completely different, two types of uh, different frameworks. Ones are for people who want to evolve the mindset, other ones are for people who do not want to evolve the mindset. The, the framework that are based on, uh, for people who do not want to evolve their mindset are based on behavioral science. So you basically teach people which habits they have to, to do, without them getting worried about why, okay? Now, the people who want to evolve the mindset is different. So one of the things is important is for a company to provide the two options. So have a different alternatives for people, flavor for people, and because not everyone wants, some people can say, listen, I, I have my kids, I'm very you know busy now, I don't want to change the mindset. Uh, tell me what to do. Tell me what the behavior you want. They're not going to talk in this way, right? But then you implicitly, they tell you. And I follow this. And, and maybe, you know, uh, if you don't want me to drink Coca-Cola, put the Coca-Cola machine in the seventh floor, uh, shut block the, the lift, and I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to get it. So in those cases, you make the, the desired behaviors easier to do and the, the behavior you don't want harder. So we also see in exponential companies, that we start having a split two kind of frameworks, the framework more based on behavioral science for people who do not want to evolve the mindset and the other ones for people who want to evolve the mindset. And I think this is interesting to acknowledge. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Thank you, Eric. Um, I can't wait to mm -hmm. read more about that. One interesting idea um, that comes to mind here is in the armed forces, for instance, when people go and train, they refer to an instance of training as an evolution. So they, they see their daily work as a sequence of evolutions. <laughs> so well, maybe for them it's an evolution. Maybe for another one, an evolution, <laughs> it means that they can do some math or calculation or for other ones that they can get more intellectual humility. So evolving, uh, it means different things, but at the end of the day, what you want is the right kind of behaviors in your company. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because you think of, we have an iteration. Well, what's an iteration other than an evolution of the product that you're developing, right? It's one increment of um, improving upon what you already have. That's a really interesting um, perspective. And again, use of language. Now, uh, are there any specific um, events happening in the near future that you'd like uh, our community to know of? Well, there are two things we are doing, and this is good you asked me. So the first thing is that um, we are organizing the, the first 
diversity and neurodiversity week where we're going to bring um, uh, neuroscientists and other people working with neurodiversity are going to be teaching people how to use the neuro exponential profiles and other things and we're going to do it for free and with translation in 36 languages and that's going to be in three days and then we're going to have also on the 5th and 6th of November we do have the Enterprise Agility World Conference and over there, uh, my idea is, guys, we have been hearing the same thing for 20, 20 years. It's time to take the industry in a different direction. So it took us one year to find people working on, on really new things and researchers. So we put all these people and we, we're going to put translation into, uh, it's a non-profit event, into 36 languages. Um, and also people are going to be able to watch. Obviously, we don't want to have... To, everyone to have a cognitive, super cognitive load. So um, we're going to record all the videos. If you don't come, you have one year to watch the, the videos. And, and that's going to be great for them with the translation. Also, if they use the, the discount code, the, the focus, okay, the focus altogether, okay. they're going get, to get, they're gonna get like 50% discount or something like this, all right? Thank you. Thank you. So um, we will provide the links and the additional information uh, uh, with the recording. So if if our re uh, listeners wants to know more, um, just take a look at the uh, additional text associated with this video. Yeah, and also we're going to have around 2,500 people in networking areas. So, you know, because I would say what is happening to you, you believe it's happening to you only. But then that problem, other people experience and solve it. So maybe by connecting with people from other, and this is something, for example, one of the um, uh, people we're going to have, she did a massive research on leadership in African countries. And then she realized so many things from African leaders, from tribes that we didn't even know it existed. And then she extrapolated in this information and created a kind of new framework for leaders to use it based on tribes. So this is the kind of thing that are great. Sometimes things are, but we don't know it exists. And by connecting with people from other latitudes, I think it's also great. Mm. Yeah, one classic idea here is Ubuntu. Uh, a lot of technical people will think, oh, the Linux <laughs> edition, but forget the fact that Ubuntu is actually an African concept uh, that, that is about unity and about I exist due to you. Uh, and, and it's the, uh, the classic greeting, Saubuona, right? I see you. Uh, I kind of bring you into being by observing you. It's, it's so powerful, so profound, so spiritual. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, and we don't know it exists. And as we know what we learn, mm. and we see what we learn, and we we see what we know. If we don't know it, we cannot say. It. And, and and then I think by learning these new things, um, it's gonna be really really powerful. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, Thank you, Aldo. Okay, so that's a wrap for for today. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, for your time and for your and sharing your thoughts and some some good tips and ideas in today's episode. I'm Aldo. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm Horia. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>